Jenkins. Uh, <clears throat> a bit about uh, Dr. Jenkins. Dr. Jenkins um, uh, is a professor uh, veterinary microbiology, Western College of Veterinary Medicine, uh, University of Saskatchewan, <clears throat> Canada. And <clears throat> Dr. Jenkins uh, did her uh, BSc honors in zoology uh, from University of Alberta and then um, started her DVM at uh, WCVM. And then she pursued her PhD in veterinary microbiology uh, at the University of Saskatchewan. Currently, uh, she is uh, acting head veterinary microbiology department as well as she's head zoonotic parasite research unit um, as well as uh, she is Canadian representative International Arctic Science Committee Terrestrial Working Group. She chairs a Wildlife Health Research Fund, uh, as well as outgoing chair Northern Studies Committee. In addition, she is also affiliated as associate member School of Public Health, uh, University of Saskatchewan, as well as uh, Canadian Wildlife Health Cooperative. Uh, in addition, Dr. Jenkins is, is uh, she is on um, um, several editorial boards of um, uh, international parasitology journals. Uh, among those, there are IJP Fall, and uh, <clears throat> she she has been working on zoonotic parasite and one health for more than fifteen years, and <clears throat> she has guided more than uh, about I think. If I'm not wrong, more than 10 uh, masters as well as PhD students. And I am fortunate to, to one of those. Uh, and she's my mentor. I am so fortunate that she accepted uh, our invitation and uh, um, <clears throat> will be uh, speaking on um, One Health today. So I welcome you, Dr. Jenkins, on behalf of our institute. Uh, and over to you now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rajneesh, and I am equally privileged to have had you work on in my lab and learned a lot from you. So thank you for this invitation and to participate. And I think I will keep the chat window open. So if people have questions, um, feel free to pop them in there. Or if you want to unmute and ask, please do. Um, but I'll ask Rajneesh to keep uh, an eye on the chat in case I missed something important. And I thought we could all use a break from COVID. So I, I want to talk about another wildlife zoonosis, um, one that is certainly a lot, lot less common, one that you actually do not have, to my knowledge, um, in India. So this is more of a, a theoretical exercise to, to talk about a, a parasite that you may not know a lot about. Um, so I'm going to take you into the wilds of Northern Canada, where the wild things live. And I just want to point out this is a real life case study that actually happened over the last six months. And there's a whole cast of authors on this first slide. And um, when we break that slide, when you break that down, it, it's kind of a typical one health grouping. So if I'm sure you're all familiar with the concept of one health, that the recognition that human, animal and environmental health are all intrinsically linked. But in practice, One Health often devolves to the animal-human interface. And furthermore, it is heavily biased toward the animal health side. It seems like on the animal health side, we have embraced One Health wholeheartedly. And the human health side, sometimes a little less so. And I think this is a very good example of the usual balance. Um, so we've got a veterinary pathologist, a wildlife veterinarian, a veterinary epidemiologist, a public health veterinarian, a veterinary parasitologist, that's me. And then of course the veterinary graduate student who actually did the work <laughs> is Temi Tokt Galapo and she's not, uh, not able to join us unfortunately, as she just had a baby two days ago. Um, so there's a large critical mass on the animal health side and then on the human health side, we had a medical doctor who is also serving as the medical health officer for the region in which this case was detected and a physician epidemiologist. So a lot more of the veterinary side than the human health side. I am going to take you to um, a province in Canada called British Columbia. So this is Canada. There's a big uh, Hudson's Bay here. British Columbia is this 
coastal paradise. Uh, they, this is where we all go to retire if we can. Um, I live here in this pale blue area, um, which is essentially the middle of Canada, also the middle of nowhere. Uh, we don't have any mountains or spectacular scenery. So in British Columbia, they have a coastal environment. Um, this is straight off their tourism site showing the kinds of things that you want to do when you go to Vancouver. You want to go to the Rocky Mountains um, and you want to go to the rainforest and you want to go surfing in the ocean. So they have many things. Um, it's a place we'd all like to be, but what they also have is a lot of wildlife. And so I'm going to be focusing in on wild canids and British Columbia is host to three main species and I've shown the distribution maps of two here. So wolves, good old fashioned gray wolves, um, are still actually fairly well established in most of British Columbia, which is very boreal and mountainous. So wild areas that um, really have very minimal human presence other than resource extraction. So you can see from these blue areas that wolves are doing quite well in the interior of BC and they actually have a toehold on Vancouver Island right here, which is um, a more temperate, coastal temperate region. So on the other side of the size scale, we also have red fox and they are very well established throughout the entire province, all the way down into the lower mainland, this southern tip of, of British Columbia. So a little more about these, these canids. Gray wolf uh, can weigh up to over 130 pounds. They are um, one of the biggest predators out there. Probably the only thing that could take down wolves uh, would be grizzly bears. And we do have those in BC as well. Wolves tend to, if they can, they hunt in packs. They prey on large ungulates like elk or uh, deer and maybe moose but they will take advantage to eat many other species, including rodents and rabbits and other smaller animals. And they do tend to be pretty standoffish. They don't want to come into human settlements for the most part. If we do see humans, if we do see wolves coming into close contact with humans, there's usually something wrong. Um, it's unusual for wolves to habituate. And they don't generally, despite some of the rumors, like to hunt people. They're, they're not that interested in us. Coyotes are kind of a, a miniature version of wolves. They weigh in 25 to 35 pound range. And they um, are not limited to just wild remote areas. They will come right into urban areas where I live, which is a, a fairly large city. I've seen coyotes running down my street. They hunt rabbits in and around the schoolyards. So they're very habituated to uh, humans, although they do well in the wild as well. So they're pretty much everywhere throughout British Columbia. Um, and they are a bit more omnivorous and um, will eat smaller prey as well as insects and fruit. And they're extremely adaptable. And then the smallest of the wild canids in British Columbia is the red fox, um, Vulpes vulpes or Vulpes fulva. And as it turns out, there's a complex history of introduction of red fox in North America. Um, we had native red fox species, but when the settlers came here, um, particularly the British settlers were not satisfied with the size of our fox. So they imported red fox from Europe so that they had something to hunt <laughs> in there. Um, so they, they brought a bunch of red fox over. So we now have a complex mix of red fox across North America that include some native species, but have probably hybridized with the European red fox as well. And they're quite small, eight, eight to 12 pounds. Um, they come in different colors and they are a valuable fur species. So there are actually fur farms as well. And they eat smaller wildlife, in particular rodents. And they like the forest edge, but they will come into, um, into cities as well as they do in, the Europe, in Europe. So I don't know if this happens very often outside of North America, but there is a, a large uh, group of people who do what we call wildlife rehabilitation. And the goal of wildlife rehabilitation is to take animals that are sick or injured and recover them to the point where they can ideally be released back to their natural habitat. Um, and most of what we rehabilitate, if you walked into any 
any wildlife rehab facility in Canada, you'd probably find birds, lots and lots of birds. Um, but we get everything and some, some, some uh, rehabilitators will specialize in different species. One here specializes in raccoons um, and it's everything all the way up to bears. So young black bears that may, their mother may have been shot. Uh, there's generally a lot of public pressure to rescue these animals to rehabilitate them and ideally release them back into the wild. And you can't just go along and find a, a, a stray animal and take it into your home. There are rules, you have to have a permit, you have to have special facilities and training, and you should have a relationship with a veterinarian who can provide care. And unfortunately, there are some animals that can't be returned to the wild. Um, often they're euthanized if they're not a species of concern for conservation. Um, some can be repurposed for educational purposes, zoos and, uh, and uh, schools and things. Others might, if they are a conservation, uh, a species of conservation concern, be used for captive breeding. But in general, the goal is minimal habituation. So these animals don't get used to people, don't start uh, acclimatizing to people. They stay wild and they go back to the wild. That's the ideal. In reality, um, probably only a very small proportion actually end up released. So I'm gonna take you through a case study. And like I said, this is a real life case study, it just happened in the last six months or so. There's a young red fox kit, which was presumably orphaned. And it was adopted by a family who decided to rehabilitate it. Um, but in the course, they had it only for a few days, but it started to develop what essentially looked a lot like neurological signs. So it was uncoordinated, ataxic, developed seizures, and even more disturbingly started foaming at the mouth. So there is, uh, there was concerns, of course, about um, what this meant, what this animal was infected with, um, as well as a welfare consideration, this animal was not doing well. So it was euthanized and the carcass was submitted for necropsy to the animal health lab. So on gross postmortem examination, the animal was in fair to good body condition. It did have some fat stores, but they were, they were reduced. There were no obvious lesions on gross examination. They did have, uh, they did recover feces from the intestine and ran a fecal flotation on it and found quite a lot of cystobizospora or coccidiosis. You can see the unsporulated oocysts here and four plus it would be a scale of one to four. So four plus would be a high intensity of infection. Um, and that would be pretty common in a young animal to see that and could even cause the, uh, the feces to be somewhat runny as well. And there were no helminth eggs detected on flotation. So I'm not sure what the vast majority of the audience is, but could, you, could a few people who are brave and bold want to type some possible diagnoses and maybe some tests you'd want to run um, on this animal to figure out what, what, it, uh, what it died of and what we need to do about it? Or you're very welcome to speak up and unmute. That's fine too. If it's hard when you have a big call. So you can either speak up or you can write it down in the chat box. So I highly encourage you to please uh, involve uh, in this actively uh, in this case study. So this is how we will proceed to the next uh, slides. So think about what it could be. So there were symptoms like uh, it was foam, foaming in the mouth and uh, <clears throat> other symptoms. So think about what, what could you uh, think about it and there is there is no right or wrong answer right so please uh, <clears throat> this is how we learn so <clears throat> and, and you will enjoy it if you start participating it so okay coccidiosis or maybe intoxication very good uh, toxicity mm. Uh, yep. Neurocystis sarcosis, okay, good.
Those are all very good suggestions. Yes. Um, we, it's interesting, the coccidiosis, um, we see a syndrome here in cattle that um, they develop a neurotoxicity as yet associated with no known neurotoxin associated with, cis, with uh, coccidiosis. And so you know, that was one thing that I, I toyed with, but it's never been reported outside of cattle. Um, fortunately, we do not have tinea psyllium in North America. So although neurocystitocosis would be, would be a valid thing elsewhere, <laughs> and toxicity is always, always a possibility, for sure, for sure. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Jay. Yeah. Rabies is sort of the elephant in the room here, right? We have, um, we actually do not have dog rabies in Canada, but we have several strains of wildlife rabies. So we have raccoon rabies, we have fox rabies, um, we have bat rabies. So, so rabies is absolutely the top of the list at this point. So those are great suggestions. Thank you everybody for jumping in there. I always find it less intimidating to just type in the chat. So by all means do so if you'd like. Um, does anybody know what, what would the next step be to rule in or out some of these diagnoses? So, so far all we've done is a gross postmortem and a fecal flow. So what do you want to do next means if, okay, uh, Jay Prakash is saying I fed, obviously for sure. Yes, excellent suggestions, both, both coming in uh, here. Similar and good. Yep, so histology for sure um, is always a good next step. Um, and then specifically for rabies, we can do an IFAT. Um, and then there's, there's other tests as well that, um, yeah, so I don't think there's an ELISA for rabies, but we can certainly look for other pathogens. Um, a, a big differential diagnosis would also be canine distemper, which does spill over into wildlife as well. Yeah, so excellent suggestions, everybody. And in fact, that's basically what happened in real life. <laughs> uh, certainly the first thing they did was send off part of the brain to uh, rule out rabies because that uh, everything, everything is on hold until we know if the animal is actually rabid. Uh, but in the meantime, they can do histology because formalin fixed specimens are not a risk to people. So they did, they did histology. And now I am not a primary pathologist. Um, these are H and E stains of the various regions of the brain from this animal. And um, there's a lot of purple and pink here. <laughs> And uh, I am informed by my esteemed pathologist friend that there's nothing abnormal here other than some freeze artifact. So that often happens with wildlife, unfortunately. We don't get them fresh. We get them after they've been frozen and maybe even frozen in thought a few times. And Canadian winters are such that uh, things freeze naturally, if you, even if you don't throw them in the freezer. So there's a little bit of freeze artifact here, but for the most part, nothing abnormal in this CNS of this animal. So that was good. Uh, this is some more close-ups. Um, in the bottom right hand corner here is not from this fox, but does anybody know, this is a neuron here. Uh, can you see the, the pointer, Rash? Yeah? Okay, so this triangular shaped object down here is a, is a neuron. There's a nucleus. And this little blob here, does anyone know what that is? Can you uh, let us know what this could be? If you can see this triangular thing in the right corner. Yeah, very good. good. Yeah, absolutely. That's a negra body and that is an inclusion, a viral right. inclusion. Absolutely pathognomonic for rabies, but uh, we did not find that in this box, but that would have been a, a really good clue. So yeah, thank you folks for chiming in there. But this is a histological section of the intestine. And so you can see here, this is the muscle layer and here is the enterocytes, the, the villi of the intestinal wall. And you can see some mucoidal goblet-y type cells here. And then all this other weird pink stuff is actually parasite 
helmet uh, material. And so we're gonna go a little closer on that. We're gonna go to a higher power. And uh, what we have here is the cranial end of one of these worms. And you can see it's got hooks at the, uh, what we call the rostellum, or the hold fast organ of the tapeworm. And then these are beautiful little suckers also on the scolex. And then as you move down, it's a, a parenchymal structure. So it's not a tube within a tube design like you'd see with a nematode. So this is a flatworm. We know it's a, a flatworm and uh, based on the fact that it has uh, hooks on its scolex, it's probably a cesto. And then this is even closer up just to show you those refractile hooks, which um, you can play with the fine focus and on a microscope. And then the other thing that tells us we're dealing with a cestode, and again, this is not how I normally diagnose parasites in animals. I don't do it by histology, but uh, the pathologist here tells me that these are beautiful calcareous corpuscles, these onion-like purple structures, and those are classically seen in histological sections of cestodes. So you know you're dealing with a tapeworm. A very weird way to get a tapeworm diagnosis, but there you go. So to sum up where we are here, we have no evidence of a meningoencephalitis, no in inflammation on histology, uh, so no evidence of rabies or another um, potential diagnosis would have been canine distemper. We do have an intestinal cestode infection based on the calcareous corpuscles. And because of the scolex, which has hooks and suckers, we know we're dealing with um, a cyclophyllid cestode. And I don't know, again, if, if there's parasitologists in the audience, but does anybody want to throw out some potential differential diagnoses for cyclophyllid cestodes that could be present in canids and, and dogs too? Absolutely. At the genus level, I think very similar to what you might find in dogs worldwide. So think about what, what uh, tape worm it could be. So. Yeah, so we have uh, the E multilocularis. It could be Echinococcus multilocularis. Okay. Even if you are not able to tell species, you can just let us know the genus Echinococcus mm -hmm. or what could be the other one or others. Think about what tape worms, think about even dog. <clears throat> yep, in a dog. I actually don't know what tapeworms are common in dogs in India, so I'm curious to see. I want to know. So Echinococcus is a genus in a larger family, and what other genera are present in that family? Oh, there might not be parasitologists in the crowd. That's okay. But I think uh, students, you can think about your, uh, if you have uh, taken a zoonosis and public health that course, we, we discuss some of the parasites of public health importance. So it's, it's a big hint actually. <laughs> and some are even just of animal health importance. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> it's not always about public health. Yeah. All right, well, I, I will jump ahead because I don't, I don't expect you guys to know North American cyclophyllid cestodes, but um, these are the, the obvious ones. So we have the flea tapeworm, Diplodium caninum. I assume if you have fleas on dogs, you have this tapeworm. <laughs> Many different species of tinea and the wildlife ones that we have here are probably a little bit different from what you have there, but uh, Hydatogena is a livestock one, so you might very well have that one. Um, and these are big, long, white ribbon-like ribbon tapeworms that can be meters long in some cases. Um, and then, of course, as somebody mentioned, Echinococcus species. And in Canada, we are blessed to have uh, more than one species. We have our own particular strains of granulosis. Um, you're probably very familiar with that in livestock. So there's the pastoral strain that circulates in sheep and, and water buffalo and dogs. But we have wildlife strains that circulate between wolves, primarily wolves, uh, and cervids like moose and elk and deer. And the ones that we have here we call E. canadensis, but they are a subtype of E. granulosis. 
And then of course we have E. multilocularis, which is mostly restricted to the Northern hemisphere. Uh, anybody want to give it, take a shot at how we can tell these apart? Based on what we have. So we unfortunately don't have any intestine left. We can't recover actual parasites um, and do morphology. So you can write in the chat box. So what do you think means how we can differentiate these? I mean, in the, in the old days when we just had morphology, it was a really big production to, uh, to clear these and prepare them properly and take very intricate measurements. But what's the quick and dirty way that we do it nowadays? Again, I tell you there is no right or wrong no. so please. <laughs> okay. Oh, um, interesting. Simran is saying, uh, mussels compare their eggs? Sure, the eggs, um, dipolidium definitely has different eggs than the tineids. Unfortunately, the tineids all produce the same eggs, very similar looking eggs. I'm asking if there's a, a way to distinguish amongst these different cestodes, and there's lots of great suggestions here. Um, yes, the rustellar hooks, if you can recover them and measure them and count them, are uh, useful for species level identification. Think about we do have tissues, we do have histology, and then think about how we can differentiate. The gravid segments, yeah, if we could get gravid segments, we could definitely open those up. Measuring proglottids, for sure, for sure we can do that. In fact, we could probably almost do that in the histo. Okay, well, these are all great suggestions, but we're super lazy these days. So we just jump straight to PCR because <laughs> it's frankly easier <laughs> than training people to do these kind of morphological identifications. You guys are probably would rock at morphological identifications compared to most of my grad students because <laughs> we just go straight to the DNA. So that's what we do. Uh, and if there's fortunately a quite a nice published PCR protocol. It's not even all that recent um, that based on conventional PCR, based on where the bands show up um, using primers for this mitochondrial, uh, the NADH mitochondrial gene and small subunit ribosomal DNA. We can distinguish amongst the three most likely suspects. Uh, Tina is gonna have a band here. E. multilocularis is going to have a band here, and E. granulosis is going to have a band here. So it's it's a pretty. It, we don't even have to go to sequencing or anything fancy. We can just look at the gel and say, this is what we got. And sure enough, it came up as E. multilocularis. And I wouldn't have been surprised um, in wildlife to find a mixed infection. Um, it is not uncommon. Like the animal right here, this this band pattern here has both the Batinia band and E. granulosis band. Very common to see co-infections. But in this case, we had a pure infection of E. multilocularis. So a little bit about the life cycle of E. multilocularis. Um, canids come in as definitive hosts with the adult tapeworms in their intestine. They would pass eggs in the feces, or proglottids sometimes pass in feces as well. Um, the life cycle then relies on an intermediate host, in this case, some kind of rodent eating those eggs and it will develop in the larvae of the rodent. And you guys might be very familiar with E. granulosis, which forms discrete fluid-filled cysts that are full of hydatid sand and full of proglottids. Alveolar echinococcosis is a little different. It still likes the liver, but it looks more like a bunch of grapes, like a small cluster of fluid-filled cysts. Um, so hence the name multilocular or multi-chambered. And many, there would be thousands and thousands of protoscolices within these little alveolar hydatids. And these rodents that are infected, um, it starts in the liver, but then it kind of grows and grows and grows. And these guys can look like they're pregnant, like waddling around with this huge belly full of parasite, uh, which is a great strategy from the parasite's viewpoint because these slow moving rodents are very easily preyed on. And that's how the life cycle gets completed when the canid eats usually the whole rodent <laughs> along and getting along with that the uh, the protoscolices 
from the larval stage in the tapeworm, in the liver of the uh, rodent. And the prepatent period, the time between when the canid eats the rodent and when those eggs are passed out in feces is about a month, about 35 days. And it is a zoonosis, just like the other strains of Echinococcus, and we can come into this life cycle if we accidentally ingest these eggs and develop in our liver. Um, and we're not, we're aberrant intermediate hosts. So sometimes it will develop fully and develop protoscolices and be a fertile parasite. Other times it's just behaves more like a metastatic um, germinal membrane going throughout the liver and sometimes metastasizing throughout the body. Uh, it's a rare disease in the Northern Hemisphere, but it does, when it does happen, it's quite serious. And if it's not detected early, it used to have a 90% case fatality rate in people. It's a lot better now if it's detected early and aggressively managed. So most people, when they think of tapeworms, they tend to think of the tinias, the dipalidiums, the long white ribbon-like tapeworms. Um, these guys aren't that at all. This is a paper clip, and this shows you that uh, they're usually between two and five millimeters long. So very, very tiny. And you can see here the scolex and mature segment and then the gravid segment here, just absolutely chock full of those uh, nice Tinaid type eggs. So they are not something that the average owner would ever see passed in the feces of their dog if it was infected. And so this was the classic life cycle of E. multilocularis. This is what we knew um, until we realized uh, due to another case that we got out of British Columbia a few a decade ago now, um, that dogs can actually come into this life cycle very strangely as an intermediate host where they become infected with the alveolar stage in their liver rather than just as definitive hosts with the adult tapeworms in their intestines. And so this index case also happened in British Columbia. The disease um, is in the larval stage is known as alveolar echinococcosis, which I'm gonna to abbreviate to AE because it's a lot easier to say. Um, that was an interesting case because we didn't, we actually had no idea dogs could be infected as aberrant intermediate hosts. This was um, not supposed to be an area where E. multilocularis was present in Canada. Um, and the other thing is that when we did further genetic characterization of this isolate from this index case, it turned out to be far more closely related to strains from Europe than strains from North America. So lots of questions about how it got here. Was it actually new? Did we just not see it before? Um, could it have come in with a dog from Europe? Because um, for whatever reason, Canada has very lax policies about bringing in dogs. And all you have to do is show a valid rabies certificate and your dog is welcome to come in. <laughs> so um, no, no mandatory testing or mandatory treatment. Uh, it also could have come in with foxes as I mentioned before people there's a, a long history of bringing foxes over uh, to North America and this European strain seems to have spread throughout a large portion of Canada at this point. This is just showing you the haplotype network so this is actually looking at three different mitochondrial genes um, looking at uh, pretty big chunks of those genes and showing that there's geographic distinction between Asian strains, strains that we find in North America, both the N1, which is the Arctic strain, and the N2, which is the strain we really expected to find um, in BC, since that was the closest place. Uh, but instead, our BC strain typed out with these European strains, um, that index dog, coyotes in the region of the index dog, and now this red fox was identical to these European type strains. And it's now basically spread over a large portion of Canada. Um, everywhere we look, essentially, we find European strains in wild canids. Um, and that is uh, including a large portion of BC, which was non-endemic previously. And how common is it in wild canids? Um, this is older data up in the far left corner, but it shows that about a quarter of any wild canids is, are probably positive for Echinococcus multilocularis at any given time. Um, and even some of our more recent studies, uh, this 72% in Western Saskatchewan, that was a study we did in trapped coyotes. <clears throat> and we were 
very shocked by how the high prevalence in the, the coyotes that we looked at. So it's pretty common in wild canids is the bottom line. How common is it in dogs? Well, we first saw that index case in 09. And since then, it's, um, it's shown up quite a bit in neighboring provinces in Western Canada. It doesn't seem to have any particular breed predilections. It's more, um, more I think, an unlucky dog who accidentally ingests the eggs. Um, what is interesting is that these animals present, if you're a veterinarian, you're gonna think this animal has a liver cancer and liver neoplasia. If you do any medical imaging, you'll see a mass, often fluid filled. Um, the only thing that might make you go, hmm, is that these animals are often quite young. So we, the mean age is four, uh, as young as a year of age. So in a young dog that pre presents with what looks to be a very aggressive liver cancer, um, e multilocularis is probably a differential diagnosis that should be on your list. And in terms of breeds, it was probably there was no strong breed predilection, although we do think that boxers and beagles were overrepresented in our fairly small case study at this point. So we have national recommendations now for how to manage this parasite in dogs. And the first is, are you in an endemic region? Yes, most of Western Canada is now. Um, we ask about the cervid carcasses because we're concerned more about E. granulosis slash E. canadensis. Um, but the risk factor here is dogs that eat wild rodents because they are quite possibly going to be infected with adult cestodes of E. multilocularis and shed eggs out in feces that are immediately infective and environmentally resistant. So in order to address that public health concern, our recommendation is for dogs that are known to hunt or eat wild rodents or simply just free range and have access to them, is to deworm them monthly year round, um, which sounds great. And, and you know, the drugs are fantastic. Prozoquantil works 99 to 100% efficacy, uh, but it's not cheap. Um, it's fairly expensive. And if you have a large dog uh, deworming monthly year round, you're probably looking at a pretty substantial amount of uh, costs that the owner is being asked to bear. The last question that we ask to assess the risk for any individual dog is, does the dog eat coyote, fox, wolf, or dog poop? And the concern there is that if they are ingesting the eggs of E. multilocularis, uh, they could develop the alveolar stage in their liver, which is, of course, not a public health concern, but a significant animal health concern. And for those animals, unfortunately, we don't have any pharmaceutical prevention. You cannot just, you, you can give these animals prosequantil, but that will have no effect whatsoever on the larval stage. Um, so those animals are at risk simply because of their behavior. And the only way to deal with that is to do, to prevent access to the eggs in feces. So our goal for management of echinococcus is if we can prevent those eggs getting into the environment, that's the ideal. Because once they're there, they're bomb proof. You can fix them in formalin, you can fix them in ethanol, you can freeze them at minus 20, and they will not die. So getting, once they're out there, it's really hard to get rid of them. Um, in the lab, if we're actually dealing with live eggs, we use a very strong bleach solution that can eat away at the shell, the very thick shell of the eggs. Um, heat and drying are our friends though. Uh, so temperatures above 60 degrees Celsius um, are usually <laughs> very sufficient to kill the eggs. And then freezing at ultra low temperatures, minus 80 or below. Um, but the concern is that in the environment, the eggs can survive months to years, long past when you would even know that there'd been canid feces there. The feces might have dried up and blown away but the eggs remain and could contaminate berries or water or produce that people are harvesting. So control is to break the life cycle, if at all possible, prevent dogs from accessing wild rodents uh, and avoiding human and dog contact with wild canids. And then as I mentioned, treating those high risk dogs primarily is a public health consideration more than an animal health consideration. So what about people? I mean, this was, 
this European strain, as far as we knew, was new, and it seemed to be behaving differently. It seemed to be causing clinical disease in dogs, which, which was unheard of before 2009. And at the time, we predicted that we would start seeing human cases. And unfortunately, we seem to be right. Um, we are now seeing many, uh, not many, but <laughs> at least 15 cases that we think were locally acquired in Alberta, which is one of our provinces. And then where I live, we um, recently published a, a human case that was identical to the, the parasite DNA sequence was identical in the person as to coyotes in Saskatchewan. And this is kind of a weird headline at the bottom, like how many people are thrilled to find that they have a rare deadly parasite. But this woman had been told she had terminal liver, liver cancer. So to hear that she actually had E. multilocularis in her liver was actually good news. Um, it's not a great disease, but there are drugs uh, like albendazole that work quite well to basically they're metastatics or parasitostatics. So they will stop the parasite metastasizing. And eventually through long-term many years of therapy you can uh, you can beat the parasite level down to um, a place where the body can eradicate it so what about the people going back to our fox case uh, what about the people involved and there were flurries of emails flying back and forth between the human physician side and the vet side and my college um, so the local general practitioner the physician who was the family physician for this group of people who were rehabilitating the fox, she contacted the medical health officer because she'd received this, this bewildering necropsy report and she wanted to know what the heck this parasite was. She'd never heard of it. Um, and so the medical health officer was the person who really reached out and connected with the animal health community. Um, because believe it or not, our veterinarians actually get more parasite training than our doctors in a lot of, in mo most of North America. So this medical health officer um, asked around a lot, asked expert opinions. Um, so some of the questions were, should these people be worried? Should, should they be concerned that this pox had E. multilocularis? Um, should they get tested? And if so, how and when? And um, what role do we have as animal health experts to really tell a doctor what to do, right? So these were questions that we just asked to a group of largely public health professionals in British Columbia. And I, I will spare you the agony of having to answer those. But these are the, this is the word cloud that they generated. So we asked people, you know, what tests should we do? Do we need to test? How soon should we test? And this is some of the answers we got. And you can see it's all over the map. Uh, some people jump to exploratory laparotomy, which seems uh, probably a little harsh <laughs> on the people involved. Uh, some people suggested fecal sampling. Now I've just shown you the life cycle. I had just literally shown these people the life cycle. And the first thing they came up with, well, it's a tapeworm, so we better do fecal testing. Do people actually shed eggs of E. multilocularis in their feces? Please say no. Someone just type no, make me happy. No, we don't. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, we're not definitive hosts. We don't get the adult tapeworms inside our intestine and we're never gonna shed eggs. Now, my ex-student was one of the, was the pathologist who actually did this case which is why I think he recognized e multi, But he was concerned after working in my lab that he'd been exposed and he went to his doctor and said, hey, you know, I wanna get tested just to make sure I don't have this horrible parasite. And the doctor sent him for a fecal. So it's quite a common misconception that, that fecals are gonna be useful. Um, some of the other suggestions are quite bang on. So imaging of the liver, is actually what we do recommend. It's one of the better screening tools for alveolar echinococcosis. Um, you have to have a portable ultrasound machine or send people for an ultrasound. Um, it is quite effective, but it's a very slow moving disease. So it's not something you can do a week after exposure. You have to wait years and then go looking. Um, serology has also got some problems as well with false negatives and positives. So there were some good suggestions in here. Um, but the bottom line is most people thought we could test right away, which is not the case, even for serology, probably months, if not a year, 
before you'd actually see a response to this very slow moving parasite. So what do we know about in people? Um, we get it from eating eggs. Obviously, nobody's out there intentionally consuming um, parasite contaminated food or water. So it's generally inadvertent. There's a bit of controversy over whether dogs themselves who perhaps rolled in poop and had eggs on their fur could be a source of infection for people. Um, I don't, as a veterinarian, like to scare people too much about petting their dogs, but um, if you wash your hands after, it's probably fine. The incubation period can be long. Like this is a heck, you think contact tracing for COVID is a nightmare. Contact tracing for an exposure that happened 15 years ago, good luck figuring out where the person got the disease. So um, as long as 15 years. Um, that is, being immunocompromised is a known predilection factor for developing human AE, and it is a faster, faster disease in them. So like I said, the best screening is serology. Plus, uh, well, the best screening is ultrasound. Serology is somewhat helpful, but too many false positives, too many false negatives to really trust it as anything other than basically an epidemiological tool. And because we're a newly endemic region for these European strains, um, we would have a very low, um, uh, well, a very high risk of false positives or a low positive predictive value of this test. And in, similar to dogs, there's really no point in doing chemoprophylaxis unless you absolutely know the person is infected because albendazole is not a very well tolerated drug um, in a lot of people and it can have bone marrow dyscrasia as, as well. So it's, it's not, a, not a thing to embark on lightly. And I think we talked about all of the, the manifestations in people. And like I said, it does have high mortality without treatment, but if it's detected early and aggressively managed either through surgical uh, debulking, as well as that long-term chemotherapy, it can be managed. And like I said, we are starting to see human cases, unfortunately, in Western Canada. So going back to our fox, once one more time, um, the big question here, this was a young fox, if you remember, it was five weeks old. And so when we look at the histo, when we look deeply at the histological pictures of this tapeworm, this is a, a, what would be a gravid segment, so a terminal segment in one of these worms. And you can see it's just all kind of purpley amorphous. These are not mature eggs. These are probably developing eggs, but they're certainly not mature eggs. On the right-hand side here, you can see a beautiful gravid segment with beautiful, fully developed tenaid type eggs in the middle. And we did not see that in this fox. So it was a very interesting case where we were basically saved by the prepatent period. This was a five week old animal. It's got a one month prepatent period. This animal must have consumed a rodent fairly early in its life, which is amazing given that most foxes don't even emerge from their den uh, until they're about five weeks of age and start hunting. Uh, but it was clearly in the prepatent period. So we did not have infective eggs present. So in this case, the fox really got the last laugh because boy, did it cause a lot of excitement. To sum it all up, the fox was taken in by people, um, eventually euthanized because they thought it had rabies, which is a horrifying public health concern. Turned out not to have rabies. Then it turned out to have Echinococcus multilocularis, which was also a very scary public health concern. This fox caused a multi-agency incident and probably really caused the family to lose a lot of sleep because as soon as people start Googling Echinococcus multilocularis and start seeing the pictures and reading the horror stories, they panic. Turns out the fox was too young to have patent E. multilocularis infection. Um, but this did raise a lot of questions. And so I think these are questions that are probably more broadly applicable outside the Canadian situation. So I thought I'd throw them out there to you guys. Um, I guess the first thing is, should we really be bringing wildlife into our homes? So even if you are a licensed rehabilitator and you know what you're doing, did we really need to save a red fox? Um, they are not an endangered species. They're doing tremendously well in North America. Um, they're possibly an introduced invasive species in some areas. And so 
should we be rehabilitating wildlife? Are there wildlife species we should put on the blacklist and say, no, like these ones should never be rehabilitated? Um, BC probably has a new threat to public health out there. They have European strains of E. multilocularis. So how do we do risk balanced communication about that so that we don't, we need to create some concern so people are aware that this is a concern for their dogs and themselves but we don't want to create panic and we don't want people to start hating wildlife and shooting them on site. Um, should we mandate treatment for this parasite in dogs? So high risk dogs, we know there's a very effective drug out there that so far we haven't seen resistance to, fingers crossed. Um, but who's gonna pay for that? You know, you've got a, a 75 pound dog that's gonna cost people hundreds, if not thousands of dollars a year to put it on these preventative drugs year round. And then realistically, what, what are we gonna do about it? So this is a wildlife reservoir zoonoses. Canadians value our wildlife. We love our wildlife. We go to parks to see them. Um, we're not gonna support massive culls of our wildlife. And even if we you know, culled every fox in the area, it would still be present in rodents, which are very hard to eradicate. And then the last question, and, and maybe looking around the Zoom table here to see wh where you guys are all from and what your backgrounds are, who needs to be, be at the table to figure out how we're gonna address these One Health problems? So does anybody wanna jump in on any of that? And so the chat what, is just fine. Yeah. So what do you think mean? who should be involved in solving such complex problems? Uh, we have a little bit of uh, uh, discussion if uh, you see the first few slides. So think about it. Who can be involved? A veterinarian, uh, epidemiologist, good, Rashmi. Who else? Pathologist, very good. Even though they have this tendency to stick everything in formalin, which frustrates me when I need DNA Very from good. those samples. <laughs> it's really good, Simran. So government and local governing board is really good. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, good, Simran. Public health personnel, good. Who else? Yeah. I will also point out that this happened during COVID. And so our poor public health personnel had far more things to deal with than than uh, than a bizarre parasite. Everyone, that's a good, in, that's an interesting question. How do you get everyone to the table though? But I think it's a good point. We can't just, can't just keep this in the area of the experts, right? I think it has, there has to be a public understanding and we have to give the public credit that they yeah, can maybe. understand things. We may have some representative of uh, journal public is going to speak on their behalf or something like that. <laughs> but th that's good otherwise, yeah. Who else? Veterinarian could be one of those. Uh, Does this situation have any resonance for you guys? Like our wildlife, would anybody bring wildlife into a re would people rehabilitate wildlife in India? Does that happen? Mm -hmm. Not that uh, to that extent, actually. So, yeah. not especially means like going means keeping in their houses and like that. But do have some rehab centers where they do uh, have wildlife and then they uh, resend them back to the woods. So, yeah. okay. So some NGOs do that. Okay, yeah. cool. I, I struggle with rehab myself because in my opinion, it does not have a population level impact. It's, it's mainly a feel good exercise for people. Um, but maybe it's an important feel good exercise. Maybe people, people feel better about our massive imprint on wildlife habitat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, I'm going to man massacre your name, Gaurab. That's a very good point because if people are left out of the decision making and left out of these kinds of discussions, they're not going to take action and they're going to be 
resentful <laughs> that they were left out. And yep. Yeah. Any other? And we do have time for one quick, quick question. If someone is having quick question, so you can ask. And if not, then uh, we may. Okay, municipal yeah. police to keep the stray dogs away to come in contact with the wildlife. Good point. Okay. I've, and, I've been to Ludiana and I've seen some of the stray dogs. So I, that's a very good point. And we have similar situations here too. So Dr. Jenkins, do you have more slides or we are all done? This is the last one. I think I ended on questions for you guys. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, it was well explained and all the participants, they, okay, was the decision to euthanize right? Could it be prevented if rightly diagnosed? That's a great question. Um, I think this animal probably had those signs because it was hypoglycemic. So it could easily have been treated properly. And we know that Prozaquantil has a very high efficacy. So absolutely, this animal could have been treated and would have posed no risk to public health once it had been treated. So was it right to euthanize it? I don't know if it had much of a prospect of making it back to the wild. Um, it didn't need to. From a public health perspective, it could have been treated. From an animal welfare perspective, it, it probably could have been managed. Um, it certainly would have been possible under um, high resource situations. Not all these wildlife rehabilitation people have a lot of money to spend, unfortunately. Uh, I think, I, Dr. Jenkins, uh, we, uh, I, I may talk to all men later on, uh, and we can discuss, I can discuss with him the vaccination stuff. So because no we do have another talk after five minutes, so sorry about that for stopping you. So before um, concluding our session, uh, I would like to thank Dr. Jenkins, and please join me in thanking Dr. Jenkins uh, for uh, speaking today and uh, uh, showering light on um, kind of opus multilacularis, as well as it is it's really a wonderful case study. We all enjoyed it. And on behalf of my institute, uh, as well as the uh, project leader, Dr. Guman, uh, who is Dean College of Veterinary Science, uh, Dr. R.S. Pollock, who is Director, School of Public Health and Zoonosis, and uh, Dr. Inderjeet Singh, who is Vice Chancellor um, University uh, for our university. He always supported us to run such webinars. And we, uh, all the participants, thank you very much for actively involved in this case study. And I, I highly encourage you to, to join. Uh, more, but this was the last one for our One Health seminar uh, webinar series. We do have a um, uh, few coming in uh, another weeks um, from Australia as well as from US. So we keep you updated. Uh, once again, thank you very much, all the participants, and thank you very much, Dr. Jenkins, and thanks, Puna Mantajeshwar, for helping in conducting these seminars. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Bye for now. I will stop sharing my screen. Oh, yeah. I will try. <laughs> Thank you very much once again, Dr. Jenkins. Thanks. Hmm. You can kick me out. I think I am. That's fine. I don't. Unable to leave. <laughs> okay. okay.